Good morning. We are uh, in the process of uh, teaching the, the understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in terms of, uh, of operation in ministry. And uh, let me say to you that I come as a young man, 15 years old, out of Brazil. And most people do not realize this, but uh, the 42% of the Brazilian people today are evangelicals. And the numbers are uh, rapidly moving to 50%. Of all, uh, all, all uh, 200 plus million people that live in Brazil. So why, why am I speaking about this? It's because in terms of Brazilian society, churches, uh, ministry, especially a church that is distinguished by its ministry and deliverance and healing. It's called Evangelical Church of the Kingdom of God, and it has close to 5 million members and 2,000 auditoriums or sanctuaries that are the largest in the world in Latin America. And so my background is, comes from a Methodist pastor that brought revival to the church in Brazil. And as you are familiar with that, First Region and in Rio de Janeiro uh, experienced growth because of the work of the Holy Spirit to the life of a bishop called uh, uh, Rob, Bob Lockman, Paul Lockman. Uh, he, he has been an instrument in bringing deliverance and healing and allow the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of the believers. And the gifts are understood and accepted and operate in the lives of every pastor in a gentle and a kind and tender way. And so uh, my background comes from South America. And uh, so there's no really discussion here as to the validity of my background because the church in Brazil, uh, especially the Methodist church, is growing rapidly as the church in the United States is decreasing and in, in dividing and splitting rapidly. And so I'm speaking into a church that, uh, that needs it. And I hope that my testimony, I hope that my, my contribution and, uh, is able to help you to, to understand uh, why is it that uh, we're, we don't have conviction of, of salvation, conviction of sin, and change in the life of the church, why the back door is larger than the front door, and how we can change this. And so it's just a person like me uh, trying to be a blessing in, in doing what God told me to do. Now, that's the point. I, I, I'm doing this because God told me to do this. I'm not doing this so you can like me. I'm doing this because you need it. So don't, don't, don't get this wrong. I'm teaching because God told me to teach. Now, why am I teaching about this? First, I don't teach about this all the time. This is perhaps the first time in six, seven, eight years that I teach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so... If you think that somehow my ministry runs around that, I think you're wrong. We don't do, we don't talk about that. But now and then I do. Every seven, eight years I do. And since I'm writing a book on this subject, I decided to, uh, to vis revisit it and, and, and teach for a couple weeks on this area so you'll be blessed. I want to give a hug to those in China. The Lord bless you in China. Those uh, of you in Brazil, and those of you in the United States, these are the three nations uh, that have the largest uh, attendance into our, uh, uh, our, our uh, ministry. Also, in about a month, we've had 7,000 plus visits on, I think it's Facebook, if I'm not too sure, or another uh, Facebook. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, I think it's YouTube, really. I have no idea where that information comes from because I don't understand. But what I'm saying to you, that a lot of people are listening to this in the thousands, and we want to bless you. So today, yesterday, I covered uh, uh, three power gifts. I called the first three revelation gifts, which is the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, or uh, in distinguishing in spirits or discerning of spirits, uh, are the three revelation gifts. And then I call the power gifts, faith gifts of healing, and working of a miracle. And so let's deal now with uh, 
gifts of healing. And, and this is where we are. So let's maybe begin by uh, uh, defining the gift of healing to you. The definition says, God's power released to bring wholeness physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Being in the right place at the right time. God's kindness upon the deserving and the undeserving. That's our, our definition of the gifts of healing. So let me put uh, into another way. How does the gift of healings uh, operate? First of all, you have the word gifts of healing. And that's the first time because you have a word of knowledge, word of wisdom, distinguish of spirits, faith, working of miracles, and gifts of healing. And then you have tongues, uh, prophecy, tongues, and, and, and interpretation. And so notice that it says gifts of, of healing. So a, a more, more broad definition would be the move of the Holy Spirit within an environment that is saturated with the presence of God. The move of the Holy Spirit in an environment that is saturated with the presence of God. Now, in America, the personality of the pastor and what he brings into the environment sucks the air in many places, not all places, not every pastor. I'm talking about that there is an existence of thinking that when the pastor proclaims the word, all the attention comes toward him. And he then is elevated to a position to where uh, the people are enthralled by his delivery and his speech. So if the pastor knows that as he is speaking and ministering to the needs of man, God can heal and restore somebody, it changes his approach to preaching. You see, it's just a mental recognition of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just, a, just a, a subconscious mental recognition that God must be doing something. Now, when you preach with that in mind, you're going to see things you've never seen before. You change the sermon. You make an invitation in the midst of the sermon. I know that churches today don't make invitations. They don't invite people forward. Uh, and I, and I, I, I'd say if you have an altar rail in your church and you are a Methodist, invite people to the altar rail. And I know that that's not common, especially in large church to where an invitation is very much uh, impossible. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was at a church with two or 3,000 people present, and I made an invitation for those people in that congregation they have had uh, an experience with blood in terms of others this week, war, crime, anger. And about a couple hundred people came forward, and many of them had weapons on them. And they were there because they needed to stop killing or destroying or hurting people. I saw a knife uh, being put down at the altar and a man falling down crying. Now, is this possible in America? Listen. Our congregations are packing. There are guns everywhere. There's guns in the preacher's office. Everybody's got a gun on the on the on the <laughs> on the on the glove glove, glove compartment. I hugged a usher in Kentucky that was packing two guns back here. And so are there people that are suffering, struggling, debating? and carrying guns that have anger. Yes, yes. If the church in Las Vegas would have been able to approach this man that is that's deeply hurting and mentally unstable uh, uh, and lay hands on him, uh, we could have had a different outcome uh, today on this horrible event. The pain and the hurt of people in America is because they need Jesus and nobody can reach them. Uh, let me give you a, an example of what I'm talking about. The Evangelical Church of the Kingdom of God is the largest denomination in Brazil. It meets uh, uh, at a place called Times Square or, uh, or, or Garden something in New York. Uh, Times 
Tom, no. Uh, uh, there's a place in New York called Garden. It's a big auditorium where there's basketball games all the time. Now, Madison Square Garden. Now, Madison Square Garden is packed on Sunday mornings with a church. I'm talking about thousands of people every Sunday morning. Now, what is the name of that church and what they do? They minister deliverance to drug addicts. Now, how are they so successful? How are they so rich and so powerful in South America? It's because they move in the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. What is First Methodist doing in downtown New York? They're empty. And that's 50 people there, over 80, and the church is dying. Do you understand what I'm saying? I need you to know that because you have rejected the work of the Holy Spirit, you have no bones mustered to minister to needs of people. You just proclaim the word and preach nicely and get an offering and get out of there. And so the gift of healing, per se, it is the move of the Holy Spirit in the environment when the presence of God in His Spirit is recognized. What do you mean by recognizing? Know that there is a Holy Spirit. Know how He operates. You see, you know there's a Holy Spirit, but you have no idea how He operates. And so you, you don't see change. You begin to preach. There's a man crying there. You should call a button and usher and bring that man forward and lay hands on his head and pray for him. But we don't want to break liturgy. We don't want to mess up the environment. We want to be careful not to offend anyone. Since when you've been allowed to be in the pulpit and not see need everywhere? Why not deal with it? The other way you do it is to go to the back room and have a five-hour counseling session, which will kill you. Why not allow the altar to be open and people come forward to receive healing and restoration and cleansing? You see, it's the way we approach ministry. We don't offend anyone. And so, gifts of healing. Let me give an example of that and uh, gifts of healing. And I'm going to go to Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 23. Mark. Is that right? Okay. Mark 4, 31. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mark 4, 23. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me go into Matthew 4, 23. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Matthew 4. It's just an example. Amen. And let me read it to you. That's the King James. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. All Galilee means Capernaum side, uh, the west side, which is the Golan Heights, the, all those towns and small towns in that area, all the way around. That's the Galilees. And then it involves Nazareth. It involves uh, all the small cities uh, that are in the area of, of the Galilees. And so he went about all, it means all Galilee. And what did he do? He taught in the synagogues. Synagogue was a place that you could get in and discuss civil matters. Well, Jesus used the synagogues to preach in them the kingdom of God. And uh, the good news of the establishment upon the earth of the perfect government of heaven as stated, it was rejected. They didn't receive it. But he preached. But as he preached, as they received the teaching, something began to happen. All healing, all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. So you're talking about all healing, all manner of sickness and diseases among the people began to happen in the life of of the believer. So why did it happen? It happened because he preached the kingdom. So if he preached the kingdom, 
Then healing began to take place. Now, preaching the kingdom means the, the ministry of Jesus on earth. He's coming to earth, the second coming, in life in heaven, in eternity. That's the kingdom of God from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth. It means the miracles, the ministry of Jesus, the grace of God, the work of the cross, the resurrection, the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, and the second coming of Christ. These, these are the kingdom of God. And as you speak about these things, the possibility that healing occur is very high. And so the gift of healing is, is, is activated by the condition of the environment and the acceptance of the presence of God. When that happens, then you begin to have miracles. You begin to have healings. People begin to respond. People begin to confess sins. People begin to go forward. People begin to be blessed. And that's, and that's what I'm referring to, the gifts of healing. Let's go to Matthew 14. Matthew 14, 35. No, I'm sorry. Matthew 14, is that right? Let me go to Matthew 14, 35. I don't think there's a 35. There is. And when, and when they were gone over to Capernaum, they came in the land of Genesaret, which is on the west side of the Galilee. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that the country round about and brought unto him all who were diseased. Now notice that they had the knowledge of him. What do you mean by that? They recognize that before them there's a power that is over any power. There is a presence that is over any presence. There is uh, an aura. There is an uh, 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 impacting power that convicted them that before them is the presence of God. Knowledge of him. Him who? Jesus. And notice that uh, <clears throat> they went out and brought everybody that was sick. And verse 36 says, And besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. As many as touched were made perfectly whole. All they wanted is, let me touch the hem of your garment. Now, who, who taught them that? How, how did they learn that the hem of their garment was enough to get whole? And so, you see, there's a knowledge. Listen, folks, let me tell you something. Mrs. Mary contributed to your church 40 years. She's got a horrible illness in her life. And she can't touch the hem of his garment because you don't even touch her. You don't visit her but once a year. Uh, uh, and when she comes to church, you shake her hand and let her go. What is it? Now, recognizing the gifts of healing will enable you to open the altar for healing and you be able to be the extension of the presence of Jesus, touching and saying, be healed in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, 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 oh, that's Pentecostal. We don't do that. That's just offend some people. Since when you're going to begin to realize that if you please God, you can't please anybody else. You can't please God in memory. You can't please God and please others. you got to please God. And so as the church comes together, as they come forward, healing begins to occur. Healing begins to occur in Wednesday night services, uh, Thursday night noon prayer time, Friday noon prayer time, and as you begin to minister. So, so instead of doing Sunday morning, do a healing service on Tuesday. Do a salvation service on Wednesday. Do a, 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 a barbecue on Friday noon and, and begin to relate and 
allow the Holy Spirit to come and heal the people of your church by, by being an extension. So recognizing the presence of the, the Holy Spirit in your sanctuary brings healing. By the way, about 20 years now, praise and worship has reached and broke through in America. Now, I'm not speaking to you as as uh, someone uh, uh, that is uh, uninformed. Music of worship and praise has created the only contact with the ground roots of America, young people, in the millions of worshiping God. There's not a church that doesn't have a song and a guitar, worship and praising God. During the praise and worship of any church, if the senior pastor recognizes the presence of the Holy Spirit and tells the congregation that, people can be healed during the praise and worship. As the music plays, God can heal. It's a gift of healing. Okay? You don't have to do nothing to deserve it. it, 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 it uh, the definition, it is God's power released to bring wholeness physically, emotionally, and spiritually, being in the right place at the right time, God's kindness upon the deserving and undeserving. You don't have to be saved to be healed. It's restoring and cleansing. And it does in environment. And so as a preacher, you come and do your text. And you begin to preach. But subconscious, you know that as they begin to hear, God is going to begin healing people. And so if you do that and you are conscious that God's going to be healed people during that service, uh, you make an invitation and let the, let the music play. And you look at your congregation and open the altar. The church that I go to, which is in Athens, Georgia, the pastor is Jerry Varnado. He is an ex-lawyer that uh, is an anointed man of God. He opens the altar for healing during the praise and worship. He opens the altar for salvation at the end of the service. So he has two invitations every Sunday. One, for people to be healed, to receive prayer. He even says that, if you come and you want to be left alone, let me, let me know that uh, you don't need prayer. Just lift your hand or don't lift your hand for prayer, and he'll leave you alone to pray. But also, if you lift your hand, he'll pray for you. That's when the worship is going on. Why that is important is because he is recognizing that God is able to heal, and the gifts of healing can operate in that environment. Amen? Let me go to an, another example of the gifts of healing. And uh, it's Matthew 14. I have a, yeah. So let's go to Matthew 4. Amen? Yeah, Matthew chapter 4. I did that? Okay. So let's go to another example then. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, Mark 7, 31. That's the one that I wanted. Mark 7, 31. Amen. Mark 7, 31. And again, departing from the coasts or the borders of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon is right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the east side of Israel. The other side, where the Golan Heights, is the west side. Is that right? Okay. I'm sorry. It's the other way around. The west side is the Mediterranean Sea. The east is toward Russia. So you, you got that straight. So he came unto the Sea of Galilee. So out of the coast, he walked straight with the disciples toward the Lake of Galilee. Through the midst of the coast, the borders of the Decapolis. He was now on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. The east side is an important, yes, because the location of, of Capernaum is on the east side. Yes, yeah, and, and he's, in the, he's in, the, uh, in the lake close to Capernaum, and he's going now to, to tell you the look. He, so, 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 so Mark, the oldest gospel, is giving you a, an idea of where Jesus is in relation to north, east, south, and west. To center your idea on where Jesus is going so you know what he's going to do. It helps. And they bring unto him 
one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. So here's a man that couldn't hear and couldn't talk, a deaf and mute man. And the word says he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers on his ears and spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he said, Ephata, be open. And straight away, his ears were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much of the more great deal, a great deal, they, they publish it. And, they, and we're beyond measure, astonished, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf and the, and the dumb speak. In this movement that Jesus is going from Tyre and Sidon all the way to the Galilee, many miracles occur which are not registered. Remember the disciples. After they passed the cooking to the Greek widows in Jerusalem, and they began to go out to minister throughout the area, that the shadow of the disciples began to heal people. Remember, remember Paul, anointed Paul, uh, praying for people and laying hands on people, and the handkerchiefs that came out of his hands began to heal, and the word was heard in all Asia, in, in Galatia means the country of, of, of Turkey today. Notice environment. Notice noticed movement. Notice how God does it. Today in Washington, beginning tomorrow, Friday, there's an event called Waking the Dawn. Our ministry is taking the cross there with Jason uh, Goings, and we're going to be represented, uh, uh, representing the state of Georgia in Washington, D.C., uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Just being there, just seeing the thousands of people that are going to be there, just smelling and breathing the environment, the air. God is going to bring healing through that event in our country. A lot of healing will occur in Washington, D.C. to the people that participate because the gift of healings is just unsolicited. One more time. The gift of healing is unsolicited. It is for the deserving and undeserving, number two. It operates in the environment when the Presence of God is recognized. So let me go, number one, unsolicited. Number two, to the undeserving and the deserving. And number three, it happens in the environment when you recognize the presence of God, in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. I want to say one more time to those of you uh, that are hearing. Number one, it's unsolicited. You don't have to ask for it. It happens. Number two, to the undeserving and the deserving. Number three, when you recognize the presence of God in our worship in which the presence of God is welcome. Now, the third uh, 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 is very difficult to, uh, to accomplish because these days the presence of God is only recognized if there's a pipe organ. The presence of God is only recognized uh, 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 if the pastor wears a black gown. And so you, you understand what I'm trying to say to you is that America has, in a way, in many, many churches, they have lost the, the, the understanding that the presence of God does salvation, does healing, paid the bills, and supports the church. But we have opened the church for people uh, who uh, uh, do not believe the resurrection, do not believe the cross, do not believe that Jesus is... Well, look, listen, there's a church in Williamsburg, Virginia, who the pastor preaches that Jesus is one of the prophets in the, uh, in the world today. He's not the Son of God. Now, he's a pastor. And by the way, he's a Methodist pastor. Now, is the presence of God there? No. Not only is not there, but the church is dying, and it will die. Now, why the church survives for a while? Because the old-timers that love that will give all their money, so we believe that way. we got to accept the God 
of the Hindus, the God of the Buddhism. Uh, we got to accept Muhammad as, a, as also a, 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 a way to heaven. And so the church is simply not a Christian church anymore, and it's dying. If you want life and you want the gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate in ministry, remember this, the gifts of healing is unsolicited. The gifts of healing is for the deserving and undeserving. It means you don't have to be saved to be healed. And number three, it operates in an environment that recognizes the presence of God. Father, thank you for this morning. Bless us as we begin and continue the day, Lord. We thank you for this day. Give us strength, Lord, to do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.